No, I just, last time I wasn't open, so I wanted to sit in today. So I'm going to mute myself, and um, I still see we have a couple of minutes here that uh, uh, we should wait until everybody can get on. Yep. Beautiful day here in Salt Lake City. We had started the chat uh, for um, asking people where they were, and we have uh, uh, Evelyn is from uh, Guatemala, I believe, and Myrtle Beach, Tampa, Florida, Fresno. Thousand Oaks. So DJ, can you see my screen on the annotation request? I've not had an annotation request. Yeah, yeah, to the audience, don't request annotation because we, um, in the size of the webinars, we just don't allow that. Okay, so I'll decline. So, yeah. All right, first time I'd seen that. Okay, and about 50 on this morning right now. People still joining? Okay. Then it is 8 o'clock, but I will wait another minute or two. Yep. Steve, what's the weather like in Houston? Folks on the phone, folks on the WebEx, I hope the weather where you are as beautiful as is Salt Lake and I'm in Denver and it's a beautiful sunny morning out today. It'll be about 70 degrees. One more minute. Oh, more. did you see that, Tim? Why not North Dakota? Ah, I've been there. So have I. Houston, um, West Virginia, uh, Myanmar. Really? Okay. Yeah, if you want to throw in the chat while you're waiting where you're joining from, that's just kind of interesting for the whole group. And just make sure you select the host presenter and all panelists so everyone can see. It's kind of nice where we can all see where we're from. Um, sometimes you can't on these, but right. Oh, I see what you mean, um, Steve. Yeah, if you would do all all panelists, that helps all of us. Yeah. Correct. How's yeah. the weather in Houston, Steve? Well, I'm not saying it's beautiful, but it's pretty much of a gloomy day this morning. Uh, nice yesterday, but today the rain is setting in. At least the temperatures are on 70 in the 70s. Sunny and 70 in Minot. That's kind right. of nice. Yeah. South yeah. Carolina, Wisconsin. Pullman. Of course, living in Idaho, I'd go through Moscow a lot. And Steve, just so you know, I made, I change you to the host role. Got it, thank you. You changed him to the what? 
not to the presenter role, to the host role, so he can see all the chat. Ah, uh, excellent. Okay. That will help. We were wondering about that. Okay, well, I probably should begin. So, um, thank you all for uh, joining this webinar. Uh, it is uh, focusing on McGraw-Hill Secondary Social Studies um, and uh, using networks in the remote classroom. And uh, you could be using networks uh, across the nation. You might be uh, in a, a state such as uh, uh, Myrtle, uh, South Carolina, or uh, across the country. Uh, but this should apply to you as well. Um, I'm Tim Reed, National Curriculum Specialist from McGraw-Hill, and, uh, and your guide today through the uh, McGraw-Hill Social Studies program and platform called Networks. So my co-host is Steve Tutunik, and he's a National Curriculum Specialist as well from McGraw-Hill Education. He'll be monitoring the uh, question and answer um, along with uh, uh, keeping me on track. So. Um, please interact with Steve. And I, I think if you have a question, rather than going through chat, uh, go ahead and go into the question and answer and, uh, and make sure that you're selecting all panelists. Or uh, maybe that's not necessary anymore, DJ, because you made Steve um, a, a special receiver of all information. Yeah, so in that case, that would be the best place to go. Okay. All right, so we'll answer you, we'll try to answer your questions throughout the uh, program today, throughout the webinar as we go through the program today. And what I'm intending to cover here is the support that you'll find um, for online, uh, the online for remote learning, and, the, and we'll take a basic digital walkthrough of the networks platform. Always trying to come back to uh, providing you with where can I find more information about something that we've talked about. So the first thing that I wanted to, um, oh, and, and uh, once again, here's Steve and me. Okay, so um, the, there, there are very important um, uh, documents and web uh, information that can be found at this digital technical support website that you see on the screen. Or you could actually talk to a live person if you called 800-437-3715. Now, if you go to that website, you're going to find um, remote classroom resources that you can uh, use right away in your classroom. Uh, some would be uh, generic, some would be for the parents, some would be for you as a teacher, some would be uh, product information. Uh, if you haven't set up uh, your accounts yet, you might have teacher uh, digital setup resources, which would uh, you know, help you with rostering or login information. Uh, there's teacher getting started, and as I mentioned, product information, and the product information would contain, um, you know, videos and PowerPoints and documents that uh, help you uh, to walk through specific areas of the program. Now, once we get in the program, into networks, then you're going to find that at the point of use, you're going to be able to click on a help button and find uh, little tutorials, little videos, little um, information about uh, what you're looking at in, in particular, whether it's assessment or, um, you know, just navigation through the program. So my assumption is that you're currently using a networks program, uh, that you have classes, that you have students in your classes, and that you're ready to go. And you're joining this webinar because, uh, well, you're just starting now, or maybe you want a refresher on the networks navigation. And we have a variety of people on and uh, districts that are represented today, uh, and you may be um, actually logging on in a different way than I will show you today. You may have a single sign-on, your district may have uh, used our integration support, um, and so I will address that in just a, a little bit as well. So this is our 2018 national lineup, um, but you could be using an older copyright, or you might be in a state such as Florida where you have your state-specific information, but Florida is still using networks. So you would see that the operations are going to be very close and they're going to be very similar. It just may, may have a different cover, um, but we are looking at networks. And so the networks uh, environment is on uh, our ConnectEd platform rather than our on learning, uh, online learning platform, which is uh, uh, primarily what California uses, but there are some networks programs that are being used in California as well, so this may apply to you. 
So we're going to go through the basics of uh, the technology today and uh, bring in the remote learning um, ideas and suggestions as we go through. But I'm first going to introduce the components, and then I'm going to look at the uh, online learning center, which is the student site. And when we go there, it's like, how does the student access uh, their materials? What about the resources? Can they see their videos? Do I have to assign something uh, so that they can actually um, you know, access the e-text? Um, all of those things will be covered. And then we're going to look at the teacher online lesson center. And so with that lesson center, it's kind of an LMS by itself. Um, and so as a teacher, you'll be able to access these resources. You'll be able to customize things like lesson plans and presentations and, and, uh, and then assign things out to students. You can assign them out uh, using our networks platform, or you could actually um, share with Google Classroom. And so we'll talk about a little bit about that, as well as assessment and our adapted program called Learn Smart. You know, how can the student actually go in and study and get that immediate feedback and have the computer assess what the student knows and what they don't know? And then, of course, I'm going to wrap it up with a summary of the key points uh, that we've covered today. And then um, I want to answer the question and answer throughout. Uh, and, and Steve and DJ are going to help me with that. Um, and I did want to uh, mention I, I introduced Steve as a national curriculum specialist. Uh, DJ West is a professional learning director uh, for the nation for, uh, well, for Steve and I and uh, other uh, members of our team. So um, I will leave some time at the end here for question and answer as well. All right, so um, teacher and the student digital. So if you haven't logged on before, uh, you um, should know that the teacher has their own lesson platform and the students have their own learning platform, which includes um, the resources and assessment and uh, skill building activities and uh, um, interactive maps as well as games and, uh, and and right down here in the middle is a question and that comes from our adaptive uh, program called Learn Smart and so whether it's the games or the interactive maps or the Learn Smart the students are able to go in and access these resources and, and actually um, this provides them with immediate feedback so that they can try this and, and do it over and over again. I think there was just a message here on did we record? Uh, are we recording? Yes, we are recording. So DJ, do you know how um, teachers on this webinar would be able to access the recording after we're finished? Okay, Tim. Yeah, we'll actually send an email out to everyone that registered and attended with a link to the video. Excellent. Okay. So um, there is another um, uh, component of technology that I really wanted to mention so that you understood this. Not all of your students are going to have internet access all of the time. Maybe they don't even have a computer to use. Uh, their, their brother, their sister is using a computer at the time, uh, but all they have is a tablet. So you would be able to um, actually download the book using the app. So the app is a connected app. And uh, with the connected app, you download the app. You go to the respective store um, and download that app. It works on uh, uh, iOS, uh, Chromebooks, as well as um, uh, other tablets and Chromebooks and phones. Now, with the tablets and the Chromebooks, you're able to actually download the entire book. With the phones, you can download chapter by chapter. So this is a way that the students can actually have their phones. The first time they log in, uh, have their uh, book on their phones, um, the first time they log in, it doesn't say e open the ebook. It actually says download the ebook. So if the student downloads the ebook on whatever device they're on, it now resides on their device. And so I would then suggest that they don't log out. The next time they come in, they just open their ebook and it's right there, whether they're online or offline. So um, the first time, however, that they do log in, they would need to put in a, a username and password. And that username and password, um, the students should have that or provided to them by the district. Now, that was the offline application of the app. There are online applications as well. 
So if you go to the resources here and you're online, the students will be able to download and uh, uh, some of the key resources, like the guided reading activities or the primary source uh, um, uh, activities, as well as uh, Learn Smart. You do need to be online when you're on the app. And um, I just got a message here. Uh, sorry, it, it, uh, uh, you won't, you aren't able to hear. So I would click on the audio button and try either to go through if, if you're unable to hear the audio. Um, go ahead and have it go through the computer. That, that's my first choice. Uh, but you could also have uh, WebEx give you a call, and, uh, and, and that way you can join the audio conference uh, while still looking at my screen uh, through, the, uh, uh, through the phone. So back to the resources. Uh, uh, some of those you do need to be online, but you can, the student can access those um, through the app. Now, if I open the book here at this point in time, now I see the book and it looks exactly like the um, a text that they would have in print. And they can navigate using the carousel down below and go to the uh, page and, uh, or, or go to the table of contents and go to the chapter and section that they're uh, working on. Uh, now, they do have a few um, items that they can do with this book here other than just read it offline. Uh, they can uh, highlight, they can take notes, they can mark up the text. Now that resides with their uh, app when they do that markup. Now I did mention earlier, and I said I was gonna come back to this whenever I thought of it, uh, the digital technical support website. So how does this apply to the app? So if I went to that, if I go to that uh, technical support site, and if you lose this, uh, this address, uh, if you didn't take a screenshot or something of it, um, you can always go to mheducation.com and go through the links to find the digital technical support. But the reason I chose this after talking about the app was that under the top trending articles here, you can see that there is a connected, um, how do I find and download the connected app for the Chromebook? And so that would be uh, very similar for the other operating systems as well. Let's go ahead and go back to my PowerPoint. And uh, so today I'm going to start um, through the portal where I log in, and that's my.mheducation.com. But as I said, you could be logging in through your district uh, single sign-on. You could be logging here in at uh, my.mheducation.com. Uh, you could be using uh, an LMS like Canvas or Clever or, or something of that nature. So once again, I'm assuming that you already know how to log in uh, for your respective district to go to your um, uh, product. Um, and so then I'm going to start from there. And, and once again, if you aren't logged in, you don't have classes or anything like that, um, there are help documents at that digital technical support website that I mentioned. All right, so I'm going to look at the uh, student edition first. And so as a student uh, comes in, if they're logging in at uh, my.mheducation.com, would look like this. Now, I do want to uh, point out that here is a help button right at this login page. That takes you to the uh, digital technical support uh, uh, website for support. And so here you have it, you have it at mheducation.com. I gave you the direct link. So I'm gonna click on login here now. And the student would see that all of their classes are in their account if, uh, if the book has been given to the students. So they would see that right here. Um, you know, and how does the, the book, if you have to do this on your own, how does a student get a book? So let me just go back here a bit, and I'm gonna log in as a teacher first. So I have no classes. I have no students in my classes. How do I start out? So first, if I have my books in my teacher account, I would see my teacher edition and my student edition. If I want to set up classes and I have to do that manually, 
I would go ahead and go into my teacher edition, and I want to manage my classes. So I'm going to go to my manage and assign. And this is, I'm not going to show the rest of this site right now, but I'm just going to show how do I set up a class? How do I add a student if I have? I'm going to go ahead and click on Manage and Assign. And when you first open this and you have no classes, you would have a large yellow um, link here that says Create a Class. When you create the class, you just name the class, you choose the grade level, don't select Use Simplified Login for this class. Uh, that is for elementary, and as it says here, it's an easy to remember icon or a pictorial password. So you want to name the class, you want to choose the grade level, and then you save that. And then you'll see that it says My Classes right here, and the pull-down menu will allow you, if you have other classes, to just go to another class. So that's how you would navigate that. Now that I have a class, how would I um, manually enter a student? Now, once again, if you use the McGraw-Hill integration um, uh, system, then uh, you would not need to create your own classes and add your own students or even uh, take those students out of your class when they leave. That should be done by the uh, IT people in your district. And if you are uh, unfamiliar with that, uh, uh, you should contact them and find out what their system is. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Add Students to add a student. And now you have different ways of adding a student as long as they're in your district system. Now, there are ways at that technical support website that will guide you through um, putting students in the system as well as then this process as well. So you can add students in a variety of ways. Once you do add them, they'll show up here. Now, I mentioned earlier, what if they don't have the book? How do they get the book if I'm doing this manually? Okay, well, let's go back out to where I first landed in my teacher account, and that's the ConnectEd icon right here. And so this is my ConnectEd homepage where I see my teacher and my student. So now I want to assign the book out to my students. So I see that under the student edition here, it just says assign the content. So if I click on assign content and I choose and confirm that that is the content, I can now look down here and any student that I already added to that class would show up on this list. I would select the box next to the last name and select next, next to confirm those students and then assign the book to them. I'm not going to do that because they already have the book and I don't want to give them two books. So that was a way for you to manually make your class, add students to the class, and then assign uh, that book to the student. Now, you would be able to also um, um, change profiles of the student. Um, I will get back to that uh, in just a minute, uh, so that if you have a struggling reader or an English language learner, uh, you can set the profile to approaching level or even English language learner at the high school. And it would give them a different narrative of the book. Same content, it would just make it an easier um, uh, read for the struggling readers. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, go back to the student edition now because I wanted to show um, what the student would see. The first thing I wanted to do was look at the student access. Okay, I'm going to stop here before I start this. Uh, uh, Steve, I'm getting some chats here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take a look at it. Um, the question is um, from Donna, if she has a co-teacher, how does she add her class to the list as a co-teacher? So there is a way in the teacher edition under manage and assign that says uh, share classes. And so you click on the class. If that teacher is um, also um, uh, able to um, access the teacher edition, they have an account, they have that uh, teacher edition assigned to them, uh, then they would have, uh, you just put in your email for that teacher and then you can share your class. And when I get back to the teacher edition, I will, I will do that. And that's all the questions I see on my end. Okay, and I'm seeing a few privately here. Um, 
Is this being recorded? We also addressed that uh, audio. I, I addressed that, um, and uh, um, somebody can't hear. Once again, with the uh, audio, um, you should be able to click on the audio for the WebEx and the WebEx sort of uh, um, dialog box um, and choose a different uh, audio. If you're not hearing it through the computer, maybe you want to have a WebEx system call you and you can actually do that. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and go into the student edition and the things I wanted to uh, point out with the student is can they access their resources? Can they access their book? Uh, if they um, don't have an assignment, what do they see? This is the home page here, and I actually have assigned chapter and lesson to this student, so you see that under the to-do to -do list here. But a student can come in here without any assignments, and they can go straight to their book using the uh, yellow tab uh, across the top, or in the middle here, uh, they can go in and uh, select a chapter. I'm in uh, chapter six right now, and opener, place and time, lessons, they can go anywhere that they want. So the last place that I had visited as a student was lesson one, the War for Independence in chapter six. And you see that's the same um, assignment that I provided with the students, so a teacher can assign this out to make sure that a student knows uh, what their assignment is and what lesson they need to go to. But I'm going to go ahead and click on this uh, middle part, go, to take me to chapter six in lesson one. All right, so if a student is working at home and they are um, able to read this um, in real time online, uh, not using the app, this is where they have their uh, digital environment that allows them to access the resources as they're reading. And so you can see those resources across the top here. But now if I, I, I do have um, ideas here for uh, supporting students who are struggling with the reading. So let's just take a look at the ways that I can provide that uh, support for guided reading for um, uh, struggling readers. So across the toolbar here, it's an a gray toolbar. Um, I'm going to start out with the headphones. So the headphones are obviously audio, so the students can listen. Lesson one, the war for independence. It matters because the page. All right, so this reads each page, um, and when you turn the page, if you do not turn the headphones off, it will start reading that next page. So um, when I'm helping my struggling readers, I can have them listen to it. Uh, that's excellent. So now um, vocabulary is very important. So as a student goes in here, uh, where can they uh, provide or get assistance for vocabulary? I'm going to actually turn the page down here. I see a highlighted word, mercenaries. So if they click on that highlighted term, they can see that that term is defined at point of use. Vocabulary for the entire lesson is found on this toolbar, both academic and content. Uh, vocabulary. And if you have a um, uh, need to look at the terms for the entire book, there is a glossary with both English and Spanish uh, terms for all of the terms in the text itself. Speaking of Spanish, at the bottom of this page, and this doesn't apply to every single text, like it's not, not going to be in psychology, uh, but you do have with our core text the pop out Spanish. And so this is a mirror translation. Uh, it is not a Google translation. So uh, this should help the students to be able to uh, make that transition using the audio and the vocabulary and this Spanish um, uh, translation, uh, make that transition to uh, understanding English. Now, note taking. I'd like to have my students mark up the text and take notes. And so the first place, you see that this item here is highlighted. I did that. As a student, I can click on the highlighter button at the top, and I, um, let's just get rid of this, but once I click on that highlighter button, it turns yellow, so I know it's active. And so if I want to, as a student, then highlight a passage of the text, it now is highlighted. I don't have to save the highlighting. It stays there. The student can come back. They can uh, 
remove the highlighting, they can leave it there for studying later. Notes. So I do want to take notes. Uh, I want my students to take notes. And so they can take notes using a reading strategy that's at the beginning of every single lesson. So you have a graphic organizer that um, mirrors the content of that lesson, and the students can take notes as they go through reading uh, this particular lesson. If I click on that, you can see that there is a text tool so that they can type in their information here. and um, save that information. So this is, uh, is basically for the students to take notes. This is for them uh, to um, in the way here. OK, great. Um, so this is a way for them to take notes uh, uh, freehand and using a graphic organizer. Now, the other um, Let's just go here. So, DJ, can I can I move that um, top toolbar? It keeps getting in the way when I want to change. Okay, so I'll just move it over here. That works. All right, let's go back to the student edition here. The other note-taking item uh, is at the top of the screen or I see that it says My Notes. So if I take a look at the My Notes, this is a way for students to actually take freehand notes as they go through the book, as they're reading. Uh, we do know, however, sometimes the students really don't know what notes they should take, uh, what questions they should ask. So over here, there is a guided notes link, and this provides them with questions where the students can answer these questions as they go through the reading. And you can see that I've answered this first question right there. I'll come back to that. Um, they would save this. Now, they do need to save the guided notes. Now, one thing about the guided notes, as well as the uh, pages that include um, dialogue boxes, where the students can type in answers to questions, such as this uh, reading progress check, you can assign this lesson. Now, you don't have to assign this lesson for the students to take notes, for those notes to stick, uh, for those students to study uh, from those notes that they've made. But if you assign the lesson, now you will be able to see the notes as a teacher. So digitally, uh, those notes show up immediately. Uh, you do not even have to have the students submit what they've um, uh, completed for that lesson before um, you can see what uh, the student is doing. Now, that applies also to the My Notes, where you assign the My Notes, and you can see the answers to the students' questions, or to the questions. All right, so some of the other things that uh, are important here that I really wanted to uh, point out, um, I looked at the highlighting, looked at the audio, we looked at the vocabulary treatment in various ways. This is all helping the students to read and really getting that feedback. The students would see all of the resources that they want. I did mention earlier that uh, um, these lessons have self-check quizzes. They have games. These provide immediate feedback and reinforcement for the content that the students are reading. So they can they see that for every single lesson. Now you can assign these, but they're right there for the students to use, and uh, you can recommend those through a messaging uh, system here, or perhaps even bring those in when you set up a discussion blog. The videos are here, one point, uh, one for every lesson. Your students are going to gain a lot of information. They will see primary sources. They will get that uh, uh, feel through these videos that are done by the BBC, are pulled for this particular chapter because they match up very well. Right, so explain just a quick question. Yes. Can you explain, when you assign the lesson progress check questions and lesson, are you assigning it just as a lesson, or do you have to assign it twice as a progress check and as a lesson? When you assign a lesson, 
So everything in that lesson would uh, be available. Any questions in that lesson? So the, where do those questions come from? They would be the progress checks. That would show up in a lesson. Now, if you have a resource, uh, let's see here. So some of the resources, and uh, I'm not finding one here. Uh, some of the resources have questions, such as this one right here. So those would also uh, be available for the teacher to see the answers uh, if a lesson is assigned. And down here at the bottom is an R. So that's, a, you know, see all the page numbers there, one through six, and then R is review. So those review questions also uh, show up if you assign a lesson. Now, uh, you would have to independently assign the My Notes. And if you wanted to assign the activities and assessment, now that's for the end of the chapter, these um, questions uh, are a separate assignment because oftentimes teachers uh, separate the chapter assessment from the lesson assessments. Did that answer the question? But Tim, you only assign it once. You don't assign the progress check separately. No, correct. you do not. No, everything that I mentioned with the lesson comes with that, that one assignment that you make. And I will show you that process uh, when we get to the teacher lesson center. Any other so questions? They had something, so if they had something they wanted more that was assessment type, they would assign that out of the assessment center, correct? Correct. So the assessment okay. center that DJ is mentioning is the test generator. And so the teacher has the ability to pull from a data bank of questions and or quizzes and tests or make their own, and those would be a separate um, assignment using the test generator through the assess tab, uh, and the teacher and the students would then take that assessment uh, here using their assess tab. All right, so um, I wanted to just continue my theme on uh, the struggling reader, and how can I help my students to read? If I'm not right there, uh, I'm having them uh, read to me or uh, really being in proximity so I can see if they're struggling or not. I mentioned earlier that I can change the profile of a student. Now, with the uh, middle school, you have two profiles, on level for everyone, and the students can always uh, see the on-level narrative, the on-level text. But if you change their profile at the middle school to approaching level, and I will show you that when we get to the teacher lesson center, they will then have a question mark on their um, toolbar. Let me just go back to page one here, or uh, lesson one, I should say. And uh, so this question mark is not there if you do not change the profile. If a teacher does not change the profile of the student, the student will not see the question mark. Once the student has the question mark and that profile has been changed, now it's the student responsibility. If they have a question about what they're reading, they can click on the question mark and it changes the narrative. So it's taking out words, it's, it's, a, it's shortening sentences. It's, it's, it, there's not a lot that needs to happen sometimes to actually lower that text reading level. And, and the, they shoot, we shoot, for about one to two grades lower with this digital reading level option for the students. And uh, now when the student logs out and comes back in, it's gonna be on level again. So they use it to help them get through some tough spots. Um, and they can always click on, you see that this question mark is now, it, it's blue. And so they can actually click on that question mark and return to the on-level reading. So I know that sometimes one to two levels does not um, reach the students that uh, are struggling the most. And so I do wanna point out another tool for the students that they have access to uh, whether you assign it or not, uh, you could certainly assign most everything with this in, within this program so it shows up on their to-do list and they know that they can do it or that they should do it. But if I go to the resources, one of the reading tools that they have is called Reading Essentials. Now, if I click on the Reading Essentials, I'll see that I have uh, 16 pages here because it actually covers every single lesson. 
So I'm going to uh, go ahead and click on uh, one of these. And I can see that this is lesson two, uh, exploring the Americas. So this reading essentials retains the uh, essential question, the guiding questions, uh, uh, timeline, as well as the map. This is the middle school that I'm showing and the vocabulary. The um, narrative here that's written is about two to three grade levels lower than the text narrative, uh, than the on-level narrative. Now, that's depending on the content as well. Um, and what other ways can we help that struggling reader, that English language learner? And this really is uh, the middle school support for uh, one of the supports for English language learners. Well, you may have heard of foldables. So foldables uh, is a three-dimensional graphic organizer activity that really helps the students to disaggregate the data, to really put things in a, in a uh, uh, graphic organizer that's uh, digital or that's, uh, excuse me, um, interactive in a way. Uh, they're marking up, they're writing, they're um, associating. And so you can see that there are questions that go along here. These questions drive the students into the narrative to, um, so that they can find text evidence. So this is all a help for really clarifying the content for the uh, struggling readers. These questions on the side would help uh, for all readers as well, drawing conclusions, comparing, contrasting. Now, when you look at this narrative, the, the students might see it uh, in a different way, the content in a different way. You may have bullet points, you may have charts, you may have other ways that really help that English language learner, the struggling reader, uh, to access that content. So the Reading Essentials and Study Guide is um, here in the student text, and I went to the Resources tab to get to the Reading Essentials. Now, there are other tagged resources here, uh, such as Learn Smart, such as the Inquiry Journal, that are also beneficial, can be assigned out um, uh, for the students. And as I'm talking about those now, I want to actually navigate to the home page of the student edition. And so that home page uh, can be easily accessed by just clicking on the title of the book in the upper left hand corner, Discovering a Past, a History of the United States. So what's really important for the students, once again, whether you assign this or not, are the featured resources that are down here on this homepage. And so the primary sources are just primary sources. Mostly you're going to, as a teacher, assign any primary sources that the students would um, use. The inquiry journal could also be assigned. Um, the inquiry journal is um, a, a process that takes the students through the inquiry process, the inquiry design model, um, and matches up, if you are familiar with this, the C3 framework, which is college, career, and civic life. So the inquiry journal can be assigned out to uh, students, or the student can actually access it just the way that I did right now without it being assigned. And so if I go into a particular chapter here, and there is one for every chapter, the inquiry journal, like the text, is set up uh, following an essential question. Now in the inquiry journal, the task is for the students to figure out what questions are they going to ask that will help them to answer this essential question. They're going to talk about it, perhaps. So in this way, if you want students to collaborate and talk about this, uh, they can um, you know, get together in whatever way, chat or whatever, and, and talk about how they're going to come up with questions that will help them to answer the session, essential questions. And then they can write those questions right here under my research questions. Now, just really quickly um, going through this process, Asking questions is the first thing that they would do. Then they would engage in research and we're taking them to the text. And we're asking, having them uh, answer certain questions, but they're doing their research based on their questions. We also want them to evaluate primary sources and secondary sources. And so here we provide them with analyzing the sources. You'll see some programs have two sources, some programs have um, one source, but it really focuses on getting the students to understand how do they analyze primary sources, and we guide them with some questions that really take into account 
for that essential question, history, geography, economics, as well as civics. At the end of the chapter then, they're going to report their findings and they're going to take action. But take action, I'm going to go down here to the bottom here, is some way to take this research information that they have compiled and actually take it beyond the classroom. And so this uh, might be a blog, it might be writing their congressman, it might be some way that they communicate this out to the community and or to the world at large. So that's the inquiry journal out of this, and it's found right at the homepage of the students under the featured resources. Another thing that is really important at this time, this unprecedented time, is uh, the last item here, BTW. So by the way, the stuff you should know is our current events website. And so one thing I'd like you to know, so you're sixth grade through 12th grade, or maybe even using networks at the fifth grade uh, level, um, you want appropriate current events. You want current events that are written at a secondary grade level, which we do with our um, articles that uh, we post. Uh, and now this current events up is updated uh, BTW is updated twice a week. And then we also have Election Central here, primary and political uh, information, candidate information, and this is updated once a week. And so with these, you have ways to extend this with uh, what do you think and dig deeper. Uh, you even have at Election Central a um, inter interactive constitution that you could use. So these are ways to bring in what's, what's happening in this unsettled world right now and providing it to the students at an appropriate grade reading level um, and one that you can take um, uh, and, and, and relate to the content. So I already mentioned reading essentials as a vital tool. Remember that reading essentials can be accessed through the app as well. And now I wanted to talk about Learn Smart. So Learn Smart is here for the students, and you do not have to, as a teacher, assign Learn Smart if you don't want to. The reason you would want to is because you only want them to work on Chapter 6, or you only want them to work on Chapter 7. If you want them to just go ahead and, and answer questions and work with Learn Smart, it's a study tool and can be used as such. I'm going to click on Learn Smart from a student perspective, and uh, this is without being assigned. Uh, they would be directed, if you did assign, they'd be directed directly to where they um, need to go. So here I see that this is the name of my class. If I had all of my classes here, the students would be able to, um, you know, they would only have that class that applied to them. So I'm going to click on section name. And I can actually, um, uh, it, I, I did set up a pretest for the students, so as a teacher, I set up a pretest to see what they knew. I'm going to skip the pretest for now and go straight into the um, uh, Learn Smart application itself. So I'm going to choose uh, a more perfect union. And now what a student can do first here, remember, this is a study tool for them. This is really a way that they understand what uh, the, the narrative is saying, uh, the major objectives, they're able to put big ideas together, and they can do that at first by outlining the chapter. And so they go in, they outline the chapter, and uh, they just drag and drop the uh, headings down below to the headings above. And I am not reading this, so I have no idea what my knowledge level is of some of these items. And then I would evaluate as a student, and oh, I have some work to do. Um, but this is all based on, you know, just sort of bringing to their mind things that they might know, some associations that they have made. I'm going to go ahead and go back here now and close out of this outline and show you the book. So this is the same text as the app text, as the print text, as the text that you find uh, in your uh, student learning center. But what's different about this is that now the text is pre-highlighted. So the major 
the objectives as well as the supporting objectives are highlighted, and those are what the students would focus on. But the other text, if they want to read this, they can uh, click on the text and it, uh, uh, it's no longer grayed out. Each question is associated with, uh, or each uh, highlighting is associated with a question. So that I can, I read through this and I read through this, uh, the highlighting portion, highlighted portions. And at some point, if I don't click on the practice icon down here in the lower left, then um, the students are going to um, be prompted to answer some questions. So they're going to go ahead and answer questions. And these questions are three part. The computer knows what the students um, know or do not know based on the answer to the question. Their metacognitive awareness down here, I know it, I think I know it, I'm unsure. And they can at any point in time click on read about this that takes them directly to that page where the highlighting is found and they can come back and answer the question. So if it takes them a long time to do this, the computer thinks that they probably don't know that answer. So these three things uh, go into what the, uh, what the uh, uh, student needs to answer to actually um, master the content. They can at any time select the reports and look at their status, topic scores, missed questions. The most challenging learning objectives is very helpful for the teacher. Um, now, once again, you do not have to assign this, but if the students are using this, you can go in and actually see what they've done, and you can look at these reports yourself. So this is something that you should check out. Learn Smart is a great tool for remote learning, and the students um, will benefit using Learn Smart with the basic information. All right, so let's go ahead and go to the teacher edition now. Tim, so before you do, before you transition, quick question on the reading essentials that you mentioned. Yes. To find the reading essential pages, can you see it when they complete it on the website? Like, are you able to see what they've done? Okay, so um, with the lessons and the um, uh, activities and chapter activities, those notes, uh, when they're in the e-text, they can, the teacher can see those answers uh, immediately. The Reading essentials must be treated as, an, uh, as a supplement, as an activity that is attached to um, an assignment. And the students would then download that activity, whether it's the guided reading activity, whether it's a vocabulary activity, or in, in this case, the reading essentials. Now, the student would then complete that and upload that to that assignment and submit it so the teacher could see that document. So clarity on that, Tim, if they're doing that, then they could resubmit that back through ConnectEd by attaching it to the assignment, or if you use Google Classroom or Dropbox or some other means, they could also return it that way, because you would have to look at it. Absolutely. And let's just take a look at that. So um, the first place that I wanted to go with the teacher is access. But the teacher's going to have access the same as the student through the resources to find all of the activities. Uh, the teacher can access the student edition right here and all of the answers to any questions uh, in the student edition with this annotated student edition. The so, student Tim? Access. Yes. Tim, just one thing. We've got about 10 minutes left. Um, yes. So we really want to make sure that we look at how to assign and then how to review that material and then how to look at how to assign Learn Smart. I think. Got it. Okay. So, um, Two places where I could assign. Generally, uh, teachers uh, would go to resources right away and take a look at the resources. Uh, and you can do a lesson search. You can do a keyword search. Um, and once you see an item here, you could do the pull-down menu, assign this resource through networks, or share it with Google Classroom. I'm not going to do that right at this point. I want to go to the other way that you can actually find resources and assign them out and that's through the lesson plans. And I can go to the chapter. And I could then go to a lesson to actually see what I would see in my teacher edition, those strategies and those suggestions. Now, if I wanted to assign an item from this lesson, such as this guided reading activity, I could certainly go in and click on tools and assign this resource. If I do that now, 
it takes me to manage and assign. The resource is already attached, the guided reading activity. Maybe I want to also add the student lesson. So I would click on Edit, Student Edition, find that lesson, Chapter 6, Lesson 1, and add that as well. Now I could also do this with my notes so that I have the notes for that lesson attached to this assignment as well. Now I'm going to be able to see as a teacher any answers in the lesson or in the notes that the student um, has written. And they also have an activity here. So that's going to give me another uh, way to look at this. Now then I can actually assign this to all my students by clicking on uh, the class and the students, writing my assignment name, my instructions, due dates, and assign. So let's go back to my um, manage and assign where I have assigned this um, lesson. And now if I send it out to the students, the students would see that assignment uh, where? See it on their home page, right under the to-do list. And if they click on that to-do list, now they see the assignment name as well as those resources. One thing that um, I wanted to clarify with uh, uh, Steve's question here was the guided notes uh, or the, uh, the uh, activity, uh, the re guided reading activity or vocabulary activity. It would be here if I assigned it, I would click on that, and then I would download that. It is a fill fillable PDF for the most part. There are some resources that are not fillable. They would then complete that on their own computer, and then they would upload that right here, and then submit when they are completed with this lesson. So now, how does that look on the student side? I did already. Um, I fill in some answers that I showed you for the lesson uh, when I was in the student edition. Um, so knowing that I answered a few questions, what does that look like from the teacher side? A teacher wants to see what the student has written. They click on manage and assign, they look at their lesson, and they look at the details of the lesson. I see the instructions, I see what resources I assigned to that lesson, and I see that my students have not yet submitted anything. But remember, I told you, as soon as a student starts writing uh, on an assignment lesson, then you can look at the details. So I know that this last student here, Timmy Reed, has um, done some work already. And so if I scroll down, I can see this is the lesson. These are the questions summarizing. Here is my answer, the progress check. Uh, so those are the first items that come up. But then I see some number questions. Well, those are the review questions. And so here I have an answer for the review question. And then finally, uh, at the end, you'll see the notes and or any resources that were attached to that lesson. So when I'm finished with looking at this particular student's work, even if they have not submitted it yet, I can comment back to that student and tell, great job, you know, uh, can you be more specific on uh, question number two in the review? And when I'm finished with that student, I can simply click on the next student. If I had another student in here, this next student button would be lit up. And I could go from student to student to student to student and review what they've done even before they have finished this and comment back to them so that perhaps I can uh, help them to correct something uh, before they submit it. Tim, two comments just uh, based on what you just mentioned. First of all, you mentioned the guided reading activities being a PDF. So there would be no way for a teacher to edit any of those guided reading questions or could they possibly take it to a Google Classroom document? Do you have any suggestions for that? Okay, so um, the guided notes here at the top um, and the guided reading activity have almost identical questions. And so if you wanted to uh, assign one or the other, you could certainly do that. If when I go into the lesson plans and I look at the chapter 
resources at a glance, and uh, I'm going to see all of the lesson resources. I know that a guided reading comes into a lesson. There may be a time when a particular resource would highlight, and it says, editable. I don't see that uh, this guided reading activity is an editable, but let's just take a look. If I click on it, ah, it is. So it downloads it as a Word document. So in this case, Steve, you could actually go into that Word document and alter that Word document. Uh, once you alter that, though, you're changing it, you would have to bring it back in. And the way that you do that is you'd bring it back in using the My Files here at the top, where you can actually add anything of your own. Just click on the My Files. You upload any new files. You find these files on your computer, and then you would uh, assign those out to the student. The target audience has to be a student, and you can change that if you want. Did that answer your question, Steve? It does. So thank you so much for showing that. We have a couple more questions. I know we're coming to the end of our time. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to kind of read off these questions. Um, so based on what you said before, when you assign the lesson or the quizzes, is that automatically going to be graded for the teacher and for the student? Okay. So the quizzes that the student would see in their lesson that are on that carousel are self-check quizzes. So those are not as assigned as such the students can see their answers immediately. Now, if a teacher comes up to assess here, this is the test generator. They can find by going into test library and my test, their data bank for the book, English and Spanish. I'm gonna click on the title to change it back to chapter one here. And I can see that the quizzes are here. If I assign, first I would have I own, and then I can assign it to the class. These would be graded as long as they are, uh, you know, multiple choice, so they're, sub they're, they're um, uh, objective questions. Right. So just to clarify, Tim, so the, the, the quizzes themselves that are connected to the resources, connected to the lessons, those are not automatically graded? They are, they are automatically graded. Uh, they are not recorded. Uh, the student can see how many questions they got right, how many they got wrong, but it's an immediate thing. Wonderful. And they, can do it, they can do it over and over and over again until they get 100%. Great. Thank you so much, Tim. And another You're question, right. tell me how to connect to, the, to, to my Google Classroom, what that looks like again. Absolutely. So if I come here to, I'm going to go to Lesson Plans, and I'm going to find a resource such as this Guided Reading Activity, and I'm going to click on Tools and Share with Google Classroom. So now I would choose a class, um, and Mr. Reed's social studies there, and I want to choose an action. What do I want to do with this? Now, um, this is uh, another um, sort of in-service by itself, uh, but what now we're actually going to be getting into the Google Classroom environment. And so what you're doing is you're either providing a link uh, to that resource. Um, they would uh, need and clarify, uh, help me here, DJ, if, if they um, do this, they need to have their connected uh, networks book open. Yeah, you just need to, if once you do it and a student goes to Google Classroom to get one of these, um, you need to have them logged in to uh, networks because in Google Classroom, it's going to be a link inside networks to that particular resource. So that's, um, that's how we share then to the classroom and, uh, and then you take it from there. Did that help, Steve? Yes, thank you, Tim. I know that our time is concluded at this time, so if you want to stay on, we'll answer a couple more questions. But if yes. not, we want to thank you, of course, for your time. And let's go ahead. I know people are appreciative and want to have a couple more questions answered. Um, so, yeah, and Steve, before you do that, just one thing. Just remember, if you have questions after this, that 800 number that Tim put on the screen, feel free to call that. Or if your students or parents are having struggles, have, they're welcome to call that number as well as far as any, um, any technical questions you have or that kind of thing. So, Steve, go ahead. 
No, we'll, we'll, we'll conclude it at that. I think that's a great solution. Thank you, DJ, for mentioning that. If they have any questions, I definitely feel free to reach out to that number. Tim, I'll and pass then, to you. Yeah, in the next 24 hours, you should get the recording sent out to you. Feel free to share that with your co colleagues as well. Yes, yeah, Steve, did you have another question? Uh, that, that's it. We'll kind of conclude it there since our time has come to an end. Okay. All right. So um, thank you so much for your time today. I do uh, appreciate your joining, and uh, we will continue these uh, videos and support so that you can um, make your remote learning experience a positive one. I do thank you very much uh, for your time. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys. Have a great day. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Steve. Thank you.